Amen. Thank you for that wonderful song. And uh, we are privileged to have a guest preacher here today. And uh, Brother Michael Jones is the pastor of Oakwood Baptist Church in Anderson, South Carolina. We are also, uh, we share the same affliction. I had him come and preach our camp a couple uh, years ago and found out that we both uh, suffer from a love of the game of golf. And uh, so we go out there and try to play that wonderful game, and uh, we were able to do that this week. And I just have a great time of fellowship with Brother Michael Jones when he uh, is around. I've met him and, and seen him and had uh, occasion to uh, be able to be with him uh, during uh, different fellowship meetings and things like that, and then other occasions that we've had. And uh, I just really love the fact that he is, number one, a great preacher of the Word of God, and number two, that he lives and he is what he says he is. And uh, you can see the genuineness of his life and his love for the Lord. And uh, so we've asked him to come and preach for us today, and we're grateful to have Brother Michael Jones here this morning. Give him a good grace and Bible Baptist welcome as he comes to preach the Word of God for us. Oh, what a joy to be with you this morning. I have been blessed by being with you guys, and thank you for the opportunity to be in the Lord's house with you on this day. Uh, turn your Bibles, please, to 1 John, 1 John, and I do appreciate your pastor, and appreciate his ministry here, and the, the times of fellowship that we have been able to have. I appreciate him uh, letting me beat him at golf this week. That was a blessing. That's, my wife says I'm an addict. I will play as much as I can, and uh, I, I guess we all ha have something like that, but... Anyway, first John, I'm glad to be with you. My only regret is that my family couldn't be with you. I've been missing them a little bit and looking forward to seeing them on tomorrow. I met my wife in Bible college. It's great how God's providence works, things like that. I grew up in Ohio. That's where I'm from. I pastor in South Carolina, but I grew up in Ohio, and uh, my wife grew up in Alaska, and uh, we met in Tennessee, and we serve in South Carolina. So, you know, you just never know what God's going to do in your life, and I uh, met a gal named Mindy, and she's a wonderful lady, and I'm so thankful for her. Uh, her relationship, and uh, when we got married and started having kids, we just kind of did the goofy thing. My wife, I'm Michael, my wife's Mindy, so we decided to name all of our children with M names. We have five children, and so I have an oldest daughter, Molly, and then I have Matthew. I have a daughter, Macy, another daughter, Mary, and my youngest son, we gave a good Bible name. We named him Maher Shalahashbaz, and uh, we just call him Mark for short. So, uh, but I love my family and wish they could be here with me today. I think they'd be a, be a blessing to you if they could be. 1 John chapter 5. Uh, let's stand together if you don't mind, and we'll read the Bible. 1 John chapter 5. The Bible's an amazing book. I love the Bible, love to study it, I love to talk about it. And I hope that the Bible is just a part of your life. You know, the Bible says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might sin against thee. And we want to make sure that we hide it in our heart. You know, you need to hide it in your heart because you might not always have it in your hand. And I think somebody that's hidden the word of God in their heart is somebody that's just going to, it's going to pop out every once in a while. You know, the Bible says, from out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. If the Word of God is in your heart, you, you will talk about it. It'll pop out. You'll refer to it. And so let's turn to its pages and learn some lessons from it today. First John chapter 5, look at verse 13. These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God. So John is talking about the purpose of why he wrote this letter. He said that ye may know that ye have eternal life. And he may be believe on the name of the Son of God. And this is the confidence that we have in him. That if we ask anything according to his will, he heareth us. And if we know that he hear us, whatsoever we ask, we know that we have the petitions that we desired of him. I want to preach to you this morning about praying with confidence. Confidence. Because we all should be praying, if you're a Christian, you know the ABCs of the Christian life, or going to church, reading your Bible, and praying. And I don't know about you, but I think prayer is probably the hardest Christian discipline there is, and I would want to encourage you in your prayer life today. Let's talk about praying with confidence. Heavenly Father, fill me with thy spirit and help me to communicate the truths of your word. Help me be a blessing to this good congregation, these dear people, and I pray that you would use the message to do a work in all of our lives, and we'll thank you in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you. you may be seated. appreciate you standing. Well, I'm a sports fan. I enjoy sports, so I use a lot of sports metaphors and illustrations. I probably uh, grew up playing baseball the most. I don't know if any baseball fans are in here. That's what I started off playing first. You know, you kind of play and do what your dad kind of introduces you to. You know, uh, I didn't grow up playing golf. My dad said that was an old man's sport. Um, I didn't grow up playing soccer. My dad said that was a communist sport. And so I just... Uh, <laughs> 
We played baseball. That's what we played, right? So uh, that's what I learned to play first. And I, I, I love baseball. Now, I've, there's some other things in my uh, life that I enjoy more in baseball now, but uh, I really I do like going to a game. I don't like watching it on TV. I get kind of bored with it on TV. Game. I really enjoy going to a game and sitting down and watching. I love being outside. I love the grass. I love the crack of the bat. I love. I think if you go to a baseball game, you need to eat shelled peanuts. That's just, just you. You have to do that. And uh, I just, I just love those kind of things. Well, baseball is kind of an unusual sport. It's the only sport where the defense has the ball. I mean, you think about that for a little bit. Uh, it doesn't have a timer on it. You know, and if you've ever watched a game on TV, you know that, uh, right? You know, it doesn't have a time. So there's a lot of unusual things about baseball. But one thing that's unusual about baseball is that if you are a good batter, if you're good at it, you get on base about 30, you get a hit about 30% of the time, 28% of the time. Right? Like, like you're successful 28% of the time. Could you imagine something that you, in your job, if you only got it right 28% of the time, I mean, how many think you would keep your job? Unless you're a weatherman, you, you wouldn't. You wouldn't, all right? I mean, think about it. We love to gripe about the umpires. We love to gripe about the referees. Could you imagine? And by the way, I've done so. I, I used to ump baseball. I've refereed basketball. And, you know, it's a very tough job. And, and believe it or not, these guys actually do a good job at it. But could you imagine if they only got it right 28% of the time? Oh, my goodness. These guys get it right probably 95% of the time, and everybody in this room wants to kill them. Uh, now, now, here's where I'm going with this. I want to ask you a question. If, if a baseball player has a batting average of 280, 290, 300, 30%, 28%, and they are a good baseball player, they're a good batter, let me ask you a question. What is your prayer batting average? I mean, that's just kind of a sobering thought because I'm just telling you right now, I have prayed for people to be saved. And I hope that you are praying for people to be saved. And if there are people that I think about on a regular basis, oh Lord, if you would save them, convict their heart, give me an opportunity to talk to them. I'm going to make an opportunity to talk to them. Uh, God, please send somebody their way. Help them to see this message or whatever the case. I, I want people to be saved and I've prayed for them and prayed for them and prayed for them and they've not gotten saved. I'd imagine I'm talking to people in the same, same situation. Uh, I have prayed for the restoration of marriages that have not been restored. Listen, every pastor has been through that. You, you care about this person, you care about these people, this couple, they're, they're struggling, you've tried to talk to them, you've prayed for them, you, you've worked with them, and you, you, you want them to make it. Maybe it's somebody in your family, you look at one of your children, one of your grandchildren, some of your neighbors, and you're praying, oh God, help them to work that out, help them to get back together, help them to solve this problem in their life, and, and you pray for that, but it doesn't happen. I, I've prayed for others to be healed, and they have not been held, healed. But here's what John says in this text. He says, we can have confidence that he hears us when we pray. I don't know about you, I've not always been confident that the Lord's heard me when I pray. You ever prayed before, and, and man, you got a big high ceiling here, but you ever felt like, man, your prayers got about a top of that ceiling, and boy, they bounced right back down to you. I mean, it's kind of like texting. I don't know if you do texting. It's a great... How many of you are old like me? You, you, you remember the days they used to charge you like 10 cents every text, man. I I'm not texting you. Boy, it wouldn't charge me. Uh, but anyway, now you can text some of you that are younger. You're like, that old man. There's a lot of things we, we, we remember in the old days there. But now when you text somebody, you, remember, you, you, you ever text somebody? I don't know about you, but I get really aggravated. One of my children or my wife, they'll text me and ask me a question. Or I'll text them and ask them a question, and I know they're on their phone because we've just had communication, and then they, it's like they go, they go offline. You were just here. And, and, and so I'm waiting for an answer, and here's what happens. You, you, you notice on your text, boy, those little dots come up there, and you're like, okay, here it comes. It comes, and then the dots go away. And then they'll show back up. Okay, here it comes. And then it goes, what's going on? Answer the text, right? You know, you ever feel that way with the Lord? 
feel like I, man, I, I'm praying, I'm talking to him, I feel like things are going on here, but, but then it's like he goes offline, and, and it's like, what's going on here? Do you think that God gets so many requests that they get lost in the shuffle? You know, like, oh, I was going to answer you, but hold on a second. I'm going to answer this guy first. Is that, is that what's going on here? Of course we know better than that. We know from the Bible that God is omniscient and he's omnipresent. And so he's not limited to time and space the way we are. And, and so he could answer all of us simultaneously if, if he chose to do so. So it's not that our requests got lost in the shuffle. Is it that God uh, intends to answer us but forgets to? I do that all the time. Man, I, I cannot, talk about your phone, I cannot stand those red dots. Listen, I, I'm going to tell you right now, it is true, you might not believe me, but I literally only have like 13 emails to read right now, and, and it's driving me nuts I got 13. I look at my wife's phone, she's got like 4,227. I'm like, you need to do something about that. And so what will happen sometimes is somebody will text me. I don't like seeing that red dot on there. And so I read the text, but I can't answer it right at that moment, and I'm going to answer it later, but then I forget. Is that what God's doing to us? Of course not. I mean, there are so many people praying at one time, God can't hear you. Listen, I grew up in a Baptist church all my life. I was Baptist born, Baptist bred, and when I die, I'll be Baptist dead. I'm just, you know, I'm one of those guys. But my grandmother's church of God. I remember the first time when I was a little boy, I went to church with my grandma. And, and, and I was, you know, I grew up in a Baptist church. I don't know, a pastor got up and said, let's pray. I, I, I'm telling you right now, I never, I never experienced that. Everybody hit the floor at the same time. I mean, it was like, it sounded like a herd of elephants running through there. Everybody's down on their knees, and they started calling out to God at the same time. Oh, Lord. I mean, and I, I don't mind that. I like that. On Wednesday nights, we have prayer time, and all God's people are raising their voices and praying. I, I love the sound of that. It's a, it's a special sound. But that's the first time I'd ever, I'd only ever heard the pastor pray. I'd never heard everybody pray like that. And they were praying. You know, Church of God people get a little bit of happiness with them, you know. They're not like some of us Baptists, you know. We get, sometimes we're saved, and we're mad about it. Man, they all praying. Boy, I was, I, man, I wasn't closing my eyes. I was looking around like, what in the world's going on around here? It, just so many prayers are going up to God at the same time that he's like, of course not. I'm trying to tell you this morning is God will hear your prayer. That's what the Bible says. We know that he hears us. Now, you might not always feel that way, but feelings can be deceiving. Feelings are not necessarily factual. The Bible says God hears your prayer. In fact, I'm going to tell you this this morning. God will answer every prayer you ever pray. You say, well, uh, are you sure about that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's different answers God gives to prayer. All right, like, like, first of all, God will give direct answers. Don't you love it when this happens? You ask God for it, and right away, boom, he gives it to you. That's a blessing. Now, that doesn't happen all the time, but sometimes God gives a direct answer. And I'll give you some Bible for that. Do you remember when the first century church, the church is just getting off the ground, and what happened is the opponents of the church uh, martyred James. And they saw that by, by killing this man, James, they, it kind of got some some brownie points for them, and they said, hey, this is working good for us in opposition to the church. Let's kill Peter. So they threw him in jail. And the early church said, well, we got to have a prayer meeting. I mean, we, we got to have a prayer meeting uh, to, so Peter will be spared and will be saved. And so the church is, I mean, they're having this late night prayer meeting, and they're praying, and while they are praying, remember they're saying, God, don't let him kill Peter. He's in jail. Get him out of jail. While they're praying, they hear a boom, 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 boom on the door. They send a servant girl down there. Rhoda, she goes down and she opens the door. And she's looking. She, I mean, maybe she pulls the thing back and she says, who is it? And Peter standing there goes, it's, it's old Pete. And she says, what? And she takes off running, doesn't even let him in. She goes running back to the prayer meeting and says, hey guys, stop praying. You're not going to believe this. Old Pete is out at the door. They're actually praying for it right at that moment and God answered correct. Now that's what happened. And I hope that if you're a praying person, you've experienced times in your life that you prayed and it was almost before you got up off your knees, God said, there you go. Not always the way, but we like it when he answers that way. And by the way, when that happens in my life, I get convicted. I'm always like, I can't believe that just happened. 
And then I'm like, man, you know what? If I'd prayed more, I bet this would happen more, you know? But sometimes God doesn't give a direct answer. Sometimes he gives a delayed answer. Sometimes you pray, and, and the answer comes, but it just comes later. I mean, for, for, I'll give you another Bible example. Abraham, he, 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 he and Sarah, they, they wanted a child. God said, okay, I'm going to give you a child. And he said, all right, great, this is going to be awesome. He was expecting to have a child in nine months. No, 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 no. He had a child 25 years later. I mean, God answered his prayer, just didn't answer it right when he wanted it. Uh, another way God answers our prayers, sometimes he, he gives us a different answer. You ever prayed for something and you kind of had it scripted out that the way you wanted God to answer it, but God, he did answer it, he just didn't do it the way you thought. I'll give you another Bible example. Lazarus had died. His sisters Mary and Martha, they wanted, they wanted the Lord to heal him. And so they prayed and they said, hey, they, and they asked him, come, come heal him. If you could just get here, you know. Jesus said, all right, I'll be there. But he took his sweet time. And Lazarus died and laid in the grave for four days. Oh, Jesus healed him. You, you remember that story? Lazarus come forth and a dead man came up out of the tomb. Oh, he healed him. Just not the way they thought he was going to heal him. The Lord does that. But you know, sometimes the Lord denies our answer. And, and, and by the way, denies our prayer. And that's an answer. He just didn't say yes, he said no. And by the way, that's the nature of a prayer request. I think sometimes we think there are prayer demands. No, a prayer request means that the person can say yes or no. And God sometimes looks at us and he says no. I'll give you another Bible example. Paul prayed three times that God would take away this thorn in the flesh, whatever it was. He prayed three times and God said no. I'm not going to do that. Throughout this particular letter, let's come back to our text. Throughout this particular letter, John has been giving tests to identify who is a true believer. I hope everybody in this room understands just because somebody says they're a Christian doesn't tests. He, he gave a test. If you go back and you study the letter and, and, and pretend like you agree with me, because if not, I'm going to have to go back to chapter 1, and you, you want to go to lunch at some point, I believe. So he gives the faith test. He says, do you believe that Jesus Christ was the Son of God who came in the flesh? You, you understand, doctrinally, he was, he was really examining them. It, it's not enough just to believe in Jesus. You have to believe in the biblical Jesus. And so he was really kind of testing on that. And he, he said, you can know that you're a true born-again believer by who you claim Jesus Christ is. Put yourself through that test. Then he said, but there's also an obedience test. He says, do you keep his commandments? Listen, somebody that has zero desire to do what the Bible says, according to John, not according to me, I'm just telling you what he wrote under the inspiration of the Spirit, he said, if you have zero desire to obey the arcing tenor of your life, you are not truly a Christian. That's what he said, and he used a lot stronger language than I just used. You can go back and read it for yourself. He also said this. He gave the love test. Do you love the brethren? Do you love other people? Especially, especially the brethren of the church? Listen, I know it's hard sometimes to love the brethren. Some of them are difficult. I'm a pastor. I know what I'm talking about. I, I, I like this little poem, to dwell above with those we love, well, that will be glory. To dwell below with those we know, well, that's a different story. <laughs> it's true, sometimes people are hard to love. Sometimes I'm hard to love. But John says, listen, if you say you love God and you don't love your brother, here's what John said, you're a liar. Now, if you've ever watched an old Western movie, them's fighting words. But that's what John said. He put him through this test, and, and the reason that he put him through this series of tests is because he wanted them to be assured. He wanted them to know that they were again. He wanted them to have confidence in it. And this confidence would translate into an effective, fruitful Christian life. And so let's come back to our text and to the purpose of our message this morning. I want to give you three conditions to confident prayer. I want you to be able to pray, whether it's kneeling, walking, standing, raising your hands to heaven. I want you to be able to pray and know that the Lord is hearing you. How can you do that? John tells us. Number one, to be confident in prayer, you, you must be saved. Verse 13, 
These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life, and that you may believe on the name of the Son of God. You see, the context of this connects it to our prayer life. Assurance of salvation is important because you cannot have a strong prayer life without assurance of salvation. Again, verses 13 and 14, they're connected. Confidence in prayer is founded on the assurance that you have eternal life. You know, some people today believe that you cannot know with certainty that you're a Christian. I, I try to, on a very regular basis, go out and knock on people's doors and talk to people. Every service that I'm, I'm there and I'm preaching, I give a, what we call an invitation. I believe this church does the same thing. We give people an invitation to come and, and, and trust Christ or do business with the Lord and respond to how He's speaking to them. And often I will ask this question, whether it's knocking on a door, or sitting at lunch with somebody, sitting in a living room with somebody, uh, in a church service, I'll ask this question. If you died today, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? Do you know I get all kinds of answers to that, but one answer that is very, very common to get is this. Nobody can know that. Nobody can know that. I want to tell you right now, according to the Bible, not according to Michael, not, not according to Pastor Webster, not, not according to some preacher, according to the Word of God, the authority of the, of the Word of God, you can know that, and you should know that. See, a lot of people just believe, well, you know, you just kind of have to wait until you die to find out if you're in or you're out. The Bible says otherwise. Verse 13 is one of the great verses. It's kind of a pinnacle verse in the entire New Testament. A lot of preachers and soul winners and evangelists, they, they use this verse because of the content of it. It's, it's so wonderful. These things that I have written unto you, that believe on the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. You don't have to hope so, think so, maybe so, got a shot in the dark. Hey, I'm about 95% sure. No, you can know this. You should know this. You see, a lack of assurance robs you of your joy in the Christian life. I know some people by disposition are just, they're worriers. Some people by disposition are, are, are pessimistic people. I'll tell you right now, when any of us ever fall into the trap of worrying and wondering, am I really saved? Did I really mean it? Am I? See, a lot of times that comes because we're, we're putting our trust in the wrong object. Did I really mean it? You're putting your trust in you. Did I say the right thing? You're putting your trust in your prayer. Am I a good enough person? You're putting your trust in your morality. You see, when you put your trust in Jesus Christ, that should be bringing confidence to you. This is some of the choruses we sang today. Wonderful. I worship you, Almighty God. That's what I want to do. But in that song, it said, You are my righteousness. That ministered because I have confidence not in my righteousness. Oh, my righteousness is ours, just filthy rags. My righteousness have bad motives many times, but He is my righteousness. You see, a lack of assurance robs you of your joy. And what it does is it ends up arresting your spiritual growth. The great Charles Haddon, Charles Haddon Spurgeon said this, We should not have been commanded to give diligence to make our calling and election sure if it were not right for us to be sure. I am sure it is right for a child of God to know that God is his Father and never to have a question in his heart as to his sonship. Do you know that you're saved? Because having an assurance of your salvation is crucial to your spiritual health and crucial to your spiritual growth. And it is crucial for you to have confidence in your prayers. J.C. Ryle also said this, Faith is the root and assurance is the flower. Doubtless, you can never have the flower without the root. But it is no less certain you may have the root. I want you to have the root. I want you to know that you're saved. But I sure would love to have you, have you have the flower in your life of knowing that you're saving, having confidence in it. When I'm confident that God is my Father and I am His Son, it brings prayer. Number two, this. To be confident in prayer, we must ask. I know many of you understand the history of this church and recognize the name John R. Rice. John R. Rice, many years ago, wrote a classic book called Prayer, Asking and receiving. I imagine many of you have read that. Now, John R. Rice was a great man that was greatly used by God. But I take a little bit of umbrage with him on that book. I don't think that you can just reduce prayer 
completely and basically to just simply asking and receiving. Study the Bible, there are many, many more aspects to prayer. And I believe Brother Rice would probably agree with that statement just the same. There's thanksgiving. Oh, you go to the Lord and you thank Him. When was the last time you thanked the Lord? That should be a regular habit in our life. Oh, there's praise. I always tell our church, praise is thanking God for what He's done. Worship is adoring God for who He is. There's intercession. We may talk about that tonight. Intercession is a big part of prayer. Who are we regularly interceding for? There are many, many aspects. Supplication, all of these things. Supplication falls into the line of asking and receiving. But while I might not say that, I might say that prayer is more than just asking and receiving, I will say this. You will not receive anything if you don't ask for it. See, notice in our text, John implies that many Christians don't ask. Look at verse 14. And this is the confidence that we have in Him that if we ask anything according to His will, He heareth us. John's making the implication that some people aren't asking. See, you should understand this by now, folks. Prayer is not optional for God's children. Somebody said it this way, prayer is the thermometer of the spiritual life. If you do not live, or if you do not pray, you are not living by faith. That's what the Bible teaches. And, and again, I want to remind you, just because you ask, it doesn't mean you'll get whatever you want. I mentioned to you I have five kids. My oldest daughter is 21 now, but when she was 19, my youngest son turned 13, and there was a period of our, of our life where we had five teenagers for about four months. Yeah, no, it was actually pretty nice, actually. My, my, my uh, house looks like a used car lot all the time, man. I mean, people are coming and going like crazy. It's a lot of fun. It's very interesting all the time. But you understand, all those teenagers, uh, and then their friends are always over our house, which we like that, but they can, they can put a whooping on the food. And my children have a certain affinity for, for ice cream. Can I get a witness for ice cream? Okay. So they love ice cream. And in fact, my children have been somehow along the way led to believe that it is a constitutional right to always have ice cream in the freezer. I, I'm, I like ice cream, but I don't go as crazy for it as they do. But the other day, man, I had this ice cream bar that somebody had uh, bought, bought me, and I ate half of it. And I wrapped the rest of it up in foil, and I was going to eat it later. And I came like two days later to eat my ice cream bar, and it was gone. I said to my wife, I said, Where, where's my ice cream bar? She said, uh, well, Mark ate it. I said, that was mine. She said, it, it was around here for two days. I mean, you can't leave ice cream around here for two days. My children, five of them are like, I call them locusts. They will descend on, on your snacks with a fierceness that dev devours the entire pantry. It's, it's, it can be very frustrating. And so therefore, ice cream does not last long. I mean, it is devoured. It's gone. And, and I'll hear this all the time. Hey, hey Dad, can, can, we, can we run to the store and get some ice cream? Well, sure. But then here's the next. Wait, can I have your card? Because while they believe it's a constitutional right to have ice cream in the freezer at all times, they do not believe it's a constitutional right to pay for it. <laughs> so the other day, my middle daughter, Macy, she said, I heard her. She didn't ask me. Her mother, I was in the living room, she was in the kitchen, and she said, hey, Mom, is it okay if we go and run to the store and get some ice cream? And Mindy said, sure, that's fine. She said, hey, Mom, um, instead of getting your card, can I just connect your card to my Apple Pay? My answer from the other room was, no. <laughs> she said, why not? She said, you're making it a lot easier. We're always running the store and getting ice cream. And you know, I don't have to ask you for the card. I just got it. It's just scanning. It, it, it'd just be simple like that. Do you have a problem with that? I do have a problem with that. Why? Because. I'm not giving you my credit card number for permanent keeps. No. <laughs> now, here's the thing. Here's the funny thing about that. She was, I told her no, but she would have never known had she not asked. You, you got to understand, to be confident in prayer, we must be willing to ask. Because 
James said it very well, didn't he? You know the verse. You have not because you ask not. We have to have confidence. It starts with knowing that we're saved. And then it leads to asking our Heavenly Father. And listen, you don't have to... Macy wasn't afraid to ask me that request. She wasn't afraid. She wasn't afraid. Why? Because I'm her dad. We have a loving relationship. Jesus taught us that. He said, what, what father, if a child asks for bread, is, what father gives him a scorpion? If they ask for an egg, what, what, what father gives him a snake? Your heavenly father cares for you. Ask him. All right, thirdly, and we'll get out of here. To be confident in prayer, we must ask according to his will. Oh, wow, here's kind of the rub. This is probably the most important principle in prayer here. We need to ask according to His will. Let me ask you a question. When people pray in our churches, how do we sign off? I mean, how do, how do people know when we're done praying? We say, in Jesus' name, Amen. Now, when Jesus said that in the Bible, you're to pray in My name, was he saying that that's what we need to do? We need to say, in Jesus' name, amen, I'm now signing off for the time being. That's not really what he meant. Now listen, I understand the debate that's gone around it where maybe in kind of an ecumenical setting or a political setting, they want you to just to say amen and not pray in Jesus' name to, to stay away from confrontation. I, I get that, and I know there are a lot of people that know I, Jesus is my Lord, and I'm going to make sure that I pray in His name. And I, and I support that, and I'm, I'm fine with that. But, but I want you to understand when Jesus said pray in my name, that's not what He was saying. In fact, there were times that I would just say amen, I'm done. There are times I've said, in your name I pray. I remember one time I had a church member, and you know, there's always that snickety guy, I noticed that today you only prayed in his name. Who's him? Yeah. You're not praying in Jesus' name, pastor. You know, that kind of thing. But anyway. <laughs> That's really not what Jesus was saying. Jesus was saying, when you pray in my name, it is an attitude of submission. Remember, that's what submission is. Surrender is doing what God wants him to do. Submission is doing it with a good attitude. And I'm submitting, I'm yielding myself to your will and your authority. And understand, prayer is a powerful tool, but it's a powerful tool for getting God's will done on earth, not our will done in heaven. And so we must have an attitude. If we want to pray in confidence, we have to have this attitude that, hey, I am submitted according to the will of God. You see, for prayer for some people, I think it's like coercing or wrangling God to get him to do what we want him to do. Like I've, I've, heard, I've heard messages that I thought were sacrilegious or maybe even blasphemous, of like, almost like trying to trick God into answering your prayers. And it's like they treat God like I treat a car salesman. Also, I, I, I've never had a root canal, but I, I have bought cars. And I think I'd rather have a root canal than buy a car from a car salesman. I'm going to change my tactic. I cannot stand, I don't know about you, but I hate it because they ask you what you do for a living. And when I tell them I'm a pastor, it's amazing how they all become religious. And then, and then they make you feel like a, a jerk because pastors aren't supposed to be jerks. Now, some of them are, but you know, I try not to be a jerk, but they make you feel like a jerk for, for wrangling with price. Well, I thought you were a pastor. So I think I'm going to walk in. Next time I buy a car, I'm going to walk in. I'm going to say, all right, all right, listen up. My name's Michael. Don't ask me anything else about myself. Don't ask me about my family because I know you don't care. I don't care about yours. You don't care about mine. Don't ask me what I do for a living because that has no semblance of what's going on in this business transaction. Now here's the rub, buddy. I got money, and I don't want to give it to you. You want my money. So let's get this over with. And I think sometimes we go to God that way. We, 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 you know, like the car salesman, he'll start off with flattery with you. And, and, then, and then they make it, don't they, they, they start, like when you say, well, no, I want it for this price, they start begging you like, oh, uh, man, I've got to feed my own children too. And then, and then you're like, well, no. And then you, so you threaten them. 
well, I'm going to leave. Come on, honey, let's go. You know, and then they're like, oh, my. and it's just all this song and dance going on. And I think sometimes we, we do this with God. We flatter him. Oh, Lord, you know, I love you. Would you give me this? Oh, you won't? I thought you loved me. Well, you don't do what I want to do. I don't know if I'll ever follow you again. You know, and we do this, this tug of war game with God. That's not the way we're supposed to pray. We're supposed to pray according to His will. It's not trying to get God to do what I want Him to do. It's trying to get me to do what God wants me to do. There's a world of difference between those two things. So, how can we get this down? Well, real quick, we need to, first of all, desire God's will. We have to be willing to do God's will before we even know what it is. I don't know if Mrs. Webster's ever done this to you, but sometimes Mindy will say, all right, I need you to do something for me, so promise me you'll do this. Well, what is it? No, 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 no. Promise me you will do this. I'm sorry, lady, I love you, but I ain't promise you nothing until I hear what it is. Listen, when it comes to God, I mean, really, we should. I don't care what it is. Before I know what it is, I will do it. Why? Because God has never asked me to do something that wasn't in my best interest and in His best interest. Why? Because he's good. He's completely and wholly good. So first of all, I, I tell teenagers and young people all the time in counseling, you want to know what God's will is? 90% of knowing God's will is just, is just wanting to do God's will. Number two, we've got to discern God's will. Now that's a million dollar question right there. How do we know what God's will is? That, that can be tricky. And sometimes we make it way too mystical than it needs to be. And I'm running out of time, so I'm going to throw real quick here though. I start with this, read God's word, because God, God's given us a, a boatload of information right here, and he'll never contradict this. Well, pastor, I've been praying about it, and I believe God wants me to murder my husband. No, 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 no. He's already talked about that. He's already, I know that's hyperbole, but he's already talked about that. Well, pastor, I just, God knows my heart, and God doesn't, doesn't mind if I, if I miss church. No, no, I, you're wrong. God's actually talked about that already. He's already addressed that. So you start with God's Word. Then you need to listen to the Holy Spirit. You know, God's Word doesn't answer every question we have about everything we should do. That's why He gave us principles and precepts. That's why He left us with the Holy Spirit. I like that little statement, obey every impulse of the Holy Spirit. You know, stay in tune with Him. Uh, here's another thing. Observe circumstances around you. I think that it should be low on your list, but sometimes circumstances, they kind of they add up to something sometimes. They reinforce what is word and what is spirit. And I'd also throw counseling in there. A multitude of counselors, there's safety. That helps us understand God's will. And then my last word of advice for you about this is just do what God says. Do his will. I love that in the model prayer. Remember the model prayer? He said, thy will be done Amen. on earth as it is in heaven. A lot of times people, when they find out what it is, they're not so sure they want to do it. You should do it. If God, right here in this service, let me ask you a question, and, I, and I'm done, I promise. I'm not trying to wear you out. God in this service came walking down the aisle in bodily form and stood right next to you and, and, and said, I'm going to reveal my will to you. Would you do it? Now, I think you would if he's standing there right there looking at you. Like, hey, bud, I got something I want you to do. Now, you're you going to do this, right? And you, well, yes, sir, you know, right? But here's the thing. In his word, he'll tell us what he wants. And we're kind of like, meh. His spirit will tell us what he wants. And we're like, meh. Counsel will tell us what, what God wants. And we're like, eh. We kind of treat God like a buffet line. Yeah, I like this. Mmm, don't like that like this, and we kind of pick and choose. When we start doing that, we can't always have real good confidence in our prayer life at that point. Why? We're not praying according to his will. There's not a lot of confidence behind that. To pray for your will is in opposition 
Uh, to pray for your will in opposition to God's will is dumb. Because it assumes that you know more about God, about what's best for your life. And God knows what's best for your life. I'd like to ask some questions. So let me ask you these questions and we're done. How confident are you in your prayer life? I, I didn't say how presumptuous are you. How confident are you? Know that God communicates with you, that God hears you. Are you confidently saved? Listen, in just a moment, if you do not know that Jesus Christ is your Savior, you do not know that you're on your way to heaven when you die. You can leave here today knowing that. Yesterday I was able to preach a youth rally here in this area. I asked, if you died today, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? If you do not know, would you raise your hand? Man, this teenage girl, boy, she shot her hand up. It was before I even finished the question. Man, she got saved. It was wonderful. Listen, you can know that you're on your way to heaven. And I want you to know that. And you have an opportunity to do that today. Are you confidently saved? Do you see the connection of your assurance of salvation to your prayer life? Here's a good question for you. I'm asking you today. What is it that you're asking God for? So I say, well, I'm not really asking God for anything. <laughs> That's a bad answer. You should have some prayer list and say, I'm asking God, because he'll never answer what you're not asking him for. Number four, are you asking according to his will? Do you desire to do his will? Do you know how to figure out what his will is? And once you know that, are you a go-getter and you're obedient to do what he said to do? Let's all bow our heads and close our eyes. Lord, thank you for your word and the help it is to us. And I pray that you would just challenge these dear people to be stronger in their prayer life. And I pray that they would have confidence in it. With your heads bowed and your eyes closed, let me ask you that question. If you died today, are you 100% sure you'd go to heaven? Now listen, I don't want to embarrass anybody. I won't do that. I cannot make you do something you don't want to do. I simply and sincerely want to help you. Is there anybody in this room this morning, and I know I don't know you well, but is there anybody in this room this morning that would say, Preacher, if I died right now, I do not know that I'd go to heaven, and I want to know more about what the Bible says about that issue. Is there anybody like that? Would you raise your hand? Again, I'm not going to make you do anything you don't want to do. God bless you. I, I appreciate that, ma'am. You can put your hand down. Is there anybody else? Thank you for being honest. Would you look at me for just a second? You raise your hand. Because I appreciate you being honest. It takes some courage to do that. Listen, the youth director's wife is on the front row. If she came to you and took you out back, just sat in a room and opened up the Bible and showed you how to know, would you be willing to let her talk to you? Okay, cool. Mrs. Fasaro, would you come? She's right, right here. When she comes by, okay, you see her? All right, cool. All right, why don't you slip out? She'll find you, and we'll just head, head back to the back. Run to her, Mrs. Fasaro. Don't, I don't want her to be by herself, you know, be alone. She don't want her to feel awkward. I mean, say, preacher, I know if I died right now, I know that I'd go to heaven when I die. I know I'm saved. Would you raise your hand big and high as a testimony? That's great. That's great. You can put your hands down. How many would just simply say this? Preacher, I'm a Christian and I do pray, but I do not pray as confidently and as consistently as I ought to. How many say, that's me? Would you raise your hand? Yep. Let me tell you folks, my hand is raised with you. Well, you're a preacher. I know, but I'm made of the same stuff you are. Oh, I wish God would help me pray more confidently and consistently. And this text helps us do that. Let's all stand to our feet as they play on the instruments here, as your custom is. If you'd like to come and pray at this altar and talk to the Lord about your prayer life, that'd be great. If you'd like to make an altar out of your seat, that would be great. Let's do business with the Lord at this time.